Good morning. So as Sam said, this is a talk about a wetland site found within a, grab this, within a peat bog at Hindford Quarry, South Lanarkshire. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of the location of the site first, um, what's in the surrounding area, go through the main results of the settlement, uh, the structures, then the finds, and then finish with a quick summary. Right, so this is the site at Hindford Quarry in South Lanarkshire, just south of Lanark at a bend in the River Clyde. It's a sand and gravel quarry currently operated by breeding quarries, and AOC have been carrying out monitoring works here since 2012. Between September 2020 and September 21, we were on site monitoring the removal of two areas of raised peat bog and further areas of topsoil stripping. You can he see here highlighted in blue on the right. Um, the previous year at the blue dot on the map, um, just in the top left there, you, we had found the remains of a roundhouse and several pits. In these pits were early Neolithic carinated bowl, beaker pottery, and later prehistoric ceramics. So this aligns with previous phases of work in the quarry um, and in the wider area, which have demonstrated broad prehistoric activity in the form of scattered pits and ceramics across this area. Now the quarry itself is just outside the buffer zone for the World Heritage Site of New Lanark. Um, and in the wider area, we have si significant evidence for Roman activity in Castle Dyke's Roman Fort, um, just seen here in the top right. This was originally a Flavian fort uh, that was rebuilt in the Antonine period around 142 AD before abandonment and later reoccupation in the later half of the second century AD. Further afield, within about five kilometers, um, to the southwest, two gold ribbon torques were found near the Douglas Water in 1834, and to the four kilometers to the south were three gold penannular armlets. Also about two kilometers to the southeast, there is Devonside enclosed roundhouse settlement, just gives you a bit of context of what's going on in the wider area. And of course, we have Hindford Cranog. So this is located near the entrance to the quarry to the northeast of our site. Um, it was excavated in 1898 by Andrew Smith and was interpreted as a lower brushwood surface overlain by a thick deposit of clay with several post rings penetrating through to the lower brushwood surface. So that's the plan of it there on the bottom right. Um, this was enclosed an area of about 10 meters with three hearths found internally. They found midden deposits with heaps of ash and animal bone and a range of artifacts, including quite a lot of glass, three bronze spiral rings, bronze beaded torque, shale bracelets and rough outs, mortarium and Samian ware situating the site within the Roman Iron Age. Now, turning to our site, though we've worked in several areas across the quarry and carried out excavations in two peat bogs, bog one and bog two, imaginatively named. I'm going to focus today on the main results from bog one. So this is bog one prior to the start of the works. Um, and you, what you're looking at here is towards the, that bend in the River Clyde with Tinto Hill visible between the peaks in the background. Um, and this is the initial removal of peat from bog one. It was removed vertically by a 30 ton excavator, revealing quite a steep slope in the substratum towards the center of the bog. This made access quite difficult. As you can see, um, the area quickly became flooded, but regular inspections of the peat face was being carried out as it was being removed. And this is what we first identified, uh, what appeared to be a brushwood platform in section below a meter and a half of peat. It was immediately recognized as being of some antiquity. And you can see here that brushwood platform from further away beneath that overburden of peat. Um, and as mentioned, access was quite tricky. Um, but we persevered uh, with careful stripping of the overburden of the peat, revealed a sub-oval enclosure. This was then isolated uh, with a buffer on a plinth while the remainder of the peat was removed in the area and other works were being carried out across the quarry. A smaller wide tract excavator was used to strip the peat across the excavation area. During this process, the site was continuously flooded by the open peat bog and not particularly helped by the winter weather in 2020. However, we kept going and opened a number of test pits and trenches to evaluate the character of what we were dealing with. Was this like Heinfried Cranog, an entire brushwood surface with clay um, and like late Bronze Age sites in Ireland like Cully Hanna? 
Was it an artificially constructed mound of clay and stones, or were there more discrete structures constructed on the peat surface? Now, just to cut to the chase, this is what we found. Three brushwood roundhouses closely nestled within a sub-oval fenced enclosure. They were of comparative size and construction, with brushwood surfaces and walkways laid out between them. This is the entrance to the site on the left, um, orientated sort of west-northwest. Unfortunately, this was the point at which the site had initially been truncated. You can see the entrance to each of those roundhouses is broadly orientated towards that main entrance area. Brushwood surfaces, possibly working areas, were found out with the, round, the entrances to both roundhouses two and three, and a long brushwood pathway leads through the center to roundhouse one at the back. So you can see there. Um, and this is a clearer shot of that entranceway um, under excavation with the substructure constructed of larger overlapping branches to either side and making up the surface, overlain by finer brushwood, leading to a sub-rectangular structure defined by five large posts. And this sort of led right into roundhouse three, left to roundhouse one and two. Um, and this is a still from the photogrammetry of the site. So what you're seeing here is not the floors of the roundhouses, but is more likely the subfloor structure. Each of the roundhouses adhered to an overarching design, um, and I'm going to discuss this quite generally. So essentially, each structure consisted of broadly three post rings surrounding a central hearth with multiple phases evident. The roundhouses measured 12 to 13 meters in overall diameter. Um, so let's look at these in a little bit more detail. Okay, so the outermost ring of each roundhouse was made up of small posts. You see that red ring is delimiting that area. And each of these was less than seven centimeters in diameter generally, forming a continuous boundary that was integrated with the brushwood substructure of the floor. There was also evidence around the outer ring, so out with that, for what may have been a double outer wall uh, comprising a more of a discontinuous second outer post line about 30 centimeters away. The posts of this were primarily at an angle, leaning away from the main roundhouse structure, and in some cases appear to have been deliberately removed and burnt. This is one of the better preserved sections on the right, I think, you, or, well, left and right, um, where you can see the wicker weaving around these posts as well on the, on the outer, outer ring. Now, the structural load of each roundhouse was borne by the inner post ring. In each roundhouse, this comprised 11 larger posts up to about 20 centimeters in diameter with flat cut bases. Um, this is Jen and Alice uh, carrying out some sampling of that inner post ring. And I hope you can make out the nice, not only that flat base, but the ax cut marks in the surface of the post. So between these um, larger posts, we, a wicker wall was woven with smaller posts. Um, these were shaped with pencil tipped ends. Um, and this inner post ring uh, generally delimited an area about seven to eight meters in diameter across, which may have comprised the main occupation area of each roundhouse. Now a third ring of posts or stakes really was found in each structure. These were arrangements of much, much smaller stakes that defined the area around the central hearth. In roundhouse two and three, these were mostly continuous sub-oval or avocado shaped in plan. But in roundhouse one, the hearth was enclosed by multiple lines of stakes, which you can see here on the, so we have roundhouse three on the left, is that sort of avocado shaped, I think. Um, and on the right, there are several lines, each of those white tags being a different stake, um, representing different phases of enclosure around that hearth. So the three broadly concentric post rings of each roundhouse not only formed the structure, but defined respective areas within each. And this spatial differentiation was also borne out in the subfloor structures. Looking again at that outer ring area, the flooring in these areas comprised tightly packed bundles of regular brushwood laid circumferentially, forming a solid flat surface. Radial branches were somewhat interwoven, though mostly seemed to overlie the bundles perhaps pinning them in place. The, this is roundhouse three on the left and roundhouse two on the right. And you can quite clearly see the regularity of that flooring in this outer area of the roundhouses. 
Um, by contrast, the inner flooring was absolute chaos. So this may have been due to more footfall in the area, but the character of the brushwood as it survived was somewhat different, made up of more irregular and often narrower branches, which, though they didn't survive very well, appeared to have been woven radially to the central heart hearth rather than circumferentially. And they were often overlaid by further finer woven layers towards the hearth itself where we did see episodes of floor replacement. Um, an interesting exception to this is the southern half of the inner ring of Roundhouse 2. Now this mirrored the construction of the flooring of the outer ring areas. So um, just towards the bottom of this image, you can see that it seems to be Circumfer circumferentially laid branches that survived much better and mirror that outer flooring. So was this a case of better survival due to less footfall? Does it indicate a different use for the area or is it some combination of both? Now the actual flooring deposits didn't survive particularly well when compared to sites like Black Loch of Merton. As you can see in this section on the left, the deposits were relatively thin, difficult to distinguish, and a lot of the materials seem to have become quite humified. Um, however, some of it survived better lower down. As you can see on the right, we had somewhat drier plant matter with visibly distinguishable wood chips and hazelnuts. Now, the roundhouses were subject to intensive sampling strategies, bulk sampling and cubianes with monolith sampling of the entire pro peat profile from acrotelm to underlying glacial sands. In Roundhouse 2, we obtained QBNS samples of the floor deposits across a one meter grid of the whole Roundhouse. So Roundhouse 2 being the one at the top. Um, with further spatially distinct sampling across the rest of the site. So all the red dots you can see here are where we obtained QBNS samples um, across the houses with multiple layers of them in certain places. And it's hoped that these will provide a really good insight into different activities being carried out both in and between the respective areas of the structures. A comprehensive wood sampling strategy was also carried out by Anne Crone and Genevieve Dimanova. This included structural elements like the posts, wicker weaving, and flooring of all three roundhouses, and hopefully will help us to relatively date the construction and repair phases of these structures, as well as provide insight into species selection and use in different areas. Now, look, turning back to the roundhouses themselves, where we had most evidence for multiple phasing was in the central hearth of each roundhouse. Each hearth structure compi comprised four distinctive phases. This was a foundation layer overlain by hearth slabs, uh, followed by three successive relaying episodes of hearth slabs. In each roundhouse, at least one of these phases of relaying was contemporary with a reflooring episode in the immediate area. Um, Possibly this was to raise the flooring to a more appropriate level or more tied into an idea of renewal. So there was a certain amount of subsidence to the lower hearthstones, but nothing that required the degree of replacement that was carried out. As you can see on the right, the hearth from Roundhouse One ended up looking a little bit like a tiered wedding cake in the end. Um, and this is a section through that same hearth. You can see here the fine wooden subflooring is overlain by a deposit, hard to see the numbers, um, 579, which is contemporary with the laying of the original hearth foundation stones in cerise pink. Um, this was a deposit of gray clay, silty sand and twigs, which was very compact. Um, and it may have been a deliberately laid flooring deposit or comprise multiple thin layers of buildup, and hopefully that's something that the micromorphology will help us to unpick. We then have multiple layers and lenses of hearth deposits, including rakeout, uh, charcoal rakeout. But then with the repeated relaying of the hearthstones, you can see that there is little to no subsidence really um, in that section. Contemporary with one of these, then we have uh, the layer that in, is in turquoise. Um, <coughs> We had the laying of a floor surface that was comprised of mostly small pebbles in a sandy matrix. So that is that upper deposit there as relayed contemporary with, with one of those hearth relaying episodes. Now down on the right, you can see an example of that reflooring in Roundhouse 2, which is entirely different because it comprised um, woven, a woven substructure rather than that pebbly floor. Um, and later hearth slabs were placed directly over that. 
Now, looking at some of the finds that we had across the site, we didn't have a lot of ceramic survival, um, but we did find some coarse ceramics in the eaves of Roundhouse 2. There were also a couple of beads, one of amber and this nice little blue glass ring bead. In terms of copper alloy objects, we had this tweezers in the top right um, and a copper alloy bracelet, there, which you can see here on the right. There are also two fragments of shale bracelet as well as several fragments of worked shale, including rough outs. We also had an abundance of core stone tools found across the site and in specific clusters within the roundhouses, including this nice decorated loom weight on the left, and on the right, a small polished stone axe. This was found in um, what appeared to be fairly sterile peat towards the center of the settlement. Now, of course, we also had some wooden objects. We had an oval wooden vessel dish. Um, we can't see it very well, unfortunately, in this image because we block lifted it off the site, so I still haven't seen it. Um, fragments of what appeared to be wooden platters, you can see in the bottom right. Um, it does just look like a plank, but it, it's some sort of pla uh, platter thing. Um, and in the top right, it was a woven basket structure. Um, perhaps most delightful of all, we also had a couple of wheels. Um, this is actually the second wheel that we found, and it was within Roundhouse 2. This was a, of tripartite plank construction with wooden dowels, similar to the Blair Drummond wheel. It had been integrated into the floor, held in place with small stakes, very, very small stakes, size of a baby finger. Um, and it was over a really nicely woven floor plan panel, which you can kind of see in the bottom right there, and in line with the threshold to the structure. But we also found a wheel of a very different type. Whoop. This was a spoked wheel, and it was found just outside the main enclosure to the southeast. Only one of the spokes survived intact, but it would have measured about one meter in diameter with 11 spokes. It has really nice carving across the surface and had clearly been turned. And you can see a little bit of detail of that carving there, it's a diagonal decoration. So, oh, there it is again. In terms of dates, we only have one radiocarbon date from a fragment from that spoked wheel, which is where that green arrow is pointing. That's where that wheel was found. Um, and it broadly situates it in the third century AD, possibly in the Severan period. Now, this wheel was found outside the main settlement. Um, it doesn't necessarily date the settlement as a whole. However, pending post X, we can broadly assign the settlement to the later Iron Age. Thinking back to Heinford Cranog, there are obviously some broad similarities. These sites may have been contemporary, but there are also some substantial differences. There is some crossover material culture, but we don't have the same types of copper alloy objects, for example. And more structurally, the sites seem to be quite different. But what is the nature of the site? Um, we have what we would call three closely situated roundhouses with associated external platforms. These are all enclosed within a sub-oval fenced enclosure. In terms of research questions that we can ask, there's huge potential. Having carried out that detailed sampling strategy in terms of wood, micromorphology, and bulk sampling, post-excavation has the potential to draw out quite precise narratives relating to construction, occupation, and abandonment. We may be able to tie in architectural and spatial differences with other indicators of activities from the bulk and micromorphology. We're just beginning to unravel the potential of this site. Now, some of these questions, were, were the structures contemporary and to what degree can we see evidence for repair or alteration? Were there different activities being carried out in the discrete structures within different parts of these structures? How long lived was the site? Was it occupied year round or more seasonally? And when we think about these closely situated yet distinct structures, how do we conceive of the identity of the people who were occupying this place? Um, and how do we relate this to the wider settlement and occupation of the area? Our site in question appears to be more of a regular settlement type. And what I mean by that is that it seems to have more in common with sites like Dryburn Bridge and Bray Head, although these are dry land sites, um, but with particularly good preservation. This is not a cran oak. It's a site built on peat, possibly during a drier phase. It's a wetland settlement, as Anne Crone might say, a wettlement. 
And if it does date to the later Iron Age or second or third centuries AD, it still has quite a lot of striking similarities with Blacklock of Merton, albeit there are some striking differences as well. We don't have those monumental entrances, but it would still be a really interesting continuation of architectural practice over perhaps seven, 800 years. But just to reiterate, we have not directly dated the settlement itself yet, so it may turn out to be closer in time. What is clear is that though the preservation is rather spectacular, is the site itself spectacular, or is it a bog standard settlement? Um, so if you'd like to find out a little bit more about the site at Bog One, you can check out our in situ website. So there's a photogrammetry model of the site there. And you can zoom in on it for a little bit more detail. And I'd just like to thank a few more people who had a huge contribution to the project. To Breeding Group for funding the works, to WOSAS for their advice and guidance, to Martin Cook, Anne Crone, Graham Cavers, Gretel Evans, Laura Connor, Marta, Pilars Marta Pilarska, who provided invaluable guidance, and of course to the many archaeologists you've seen through these slides who worked on the site. Um, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed that overview of the wetland sites. Stay tuned for further updates from the Postex, and thank you.